Welcome back, everybody, to another webinar organized uh, by Princeton. We're very happy to have Ed Glazer from Harvard University with us. He will talk about survival of the city. Hi, Ed. It's great to have you with us. It's wonderful to be here, Marcus. Thank you. Ed is one of the authorities on cities and has recently written a new book. And the book is called The Survival of the City. And it touches on many aspects uh, we have learned about the COVID crisis. But uh, he has worked for many, many decades now on uh, cities. <laughs> and he will give us his insights, uh, what we can learn. Before we move to Ed, I would like to give some opening remarks and raise some questions because I'm not really an expert in this area, so I'm very happy to learn more uh, about this topic. The book is with his colleague, David Cutler, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure to read and even has in the introduction some sentence in German, which I pick up later. So I'm of course seeing these days, I'm seeing everything in the lens of resilience and i was wondering you know how resilient are cities and bounce back i think ed has written a lot about boston how resilient and how much boston reinvented itself over the decades but i was wondering whether the resilience of a city is different depending whether the city is, is you know, more organically grown from the bottom up or is more designed centrally like from top down uh, you know like robert moses has done this or you have some more you know uh, designed centrally, like many Chinese cities, uh, modern cities are more designed centrally. Is, does it make a big difference? So I was wondering. And if if it does so, it might give us some lens, you know, how resilient our autocracy is versus to uh, democracies, where it's more bottom up or it's more from the top down. The other puzzle I have about resilience in cities, it seems like it could be that the countryside is more resilient because it's less specialized. So if you live in in big cities, there's more agglomeration benefits, and that leads to more specialization, more networks, more reliance on others, and it might make you more vulnerable and less resilient. So once you have a shock, it might be harder to bounce back or not. That's, uh, it's an open question to me. Of course, in cities, you have more spillovers, but also spillbacks, and you might have different social norms. So there's a big difference in attitude towards vaccination between you know, the cities and the countryside. And you know, that's a big question. On the other hand, and as Ed pointed out in his book, Stadtluft macht frei, so city air is liberating. So that's because I guess cities make you much more productive. And that was at the olden days, just liberating you from the king or the duke who was ruling you. And uh, that established essentially the citizens uh, of a country to be you know, part of a democracy and rule themselves. And um, and also there's a big difference between countryside and, and the cities about the trust in authorities. And uh, I was wondering whether there's something uh, to be said about this. And if you trust more authorities, does it make you more resilient or less resilient because you also rely on the authorities and don't take the own initiative uh, to make yourself more resilient? But the other big thing, which is of course uh, making a core is COVID. And uh, the book is very much about COVID and you know, one consequence might be that we have fewer high-rise buildings. People will be afraid of going into lifts. And you know, will we move from skyscrapers to more office parks? So the whole design of the cities will be different, will be more spread out. This has implications for traffic. And of course, it is famous donut effect, which we have heard earlier from Nick Bloom when he gave his webinar some while back. You know, what, how what are this donut effect? Essentially, the suburbia will benefit a lot while the city centers will struggle. And this would be interesting uh, to discuss as well. And finally, there is something like smart cities. So, from earlier plagues and other things, uh, you know, new sewage was developed and all this. Will we have something similar from COVID where we have some new hygiene management involving a lot of digitalization? Is there a better way of, of doing things uh, along these lines? Because, you know, we move in the digital area, COVID was a booster for digitalization. And is it also helping us in some hygiene management comparable to earlier uh, city plagues, which also helped cities to become more hygienic and uh, control essentially potential outbreaks of, uh, of diseases. Finally, coming to uh, some work, uh, Ed has worked a lot on zoning. And I think he's a big proponent to change zoning roles. So it's that zooming, not zoning. And what, you know, we have this telecommunication, as I mentioned earlier, that might have different implications on, on traffic, very different ones, uh, might have implications on real estate prices. And again, this, uh, this uh, donut effect 
the higher prices of suburbia, we see this in where I live in Princeton, uh, house prices went up significantly because many people from the cities are moving out uh, to the countryside. So a lot of New Yorkers move to Princeton. And it might also have this uh, ease of working from home it might also even affect what marriages and couples will be formed. That's perhaps a little bit more speculative, but it might affect it. You know, you can work from home, you can have a marriage arrangement or between a couple, one in the East Coast, one in the West Coast, is much easier these days than it was before COVID. And it might also balance the gender equality. And you might have even more kids because you can live together, both working from home. Uh, and that's, you know, one thing to consider. Finally, I would like to say a few words about mobility. And there are some interesting mobility connections. One is the virtual mobility, which we're assuming uh, will give us uh, now with telecommunication and all that. But this might also lead to more physical mobility for the rich to leave poor neighborhoods and leave or leave a city and leave the poor behind in, 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 in neighborhoods. So does Zoom make it easier for the rich to leave? And is there more segregation possible because we don't have to cram into the same zone essentially? And what's about social mobility? Uh, can it be more easily promoted if the rich can leave very easily? The poor is very hard to impose taxes, but more generally, uh, we can also see with these new technologies, we can see a competition among the cities. So enhanced competition among the cities. And is this good or is this bad? It's a big question I have. Uh, it might improve the governance. So if you have less freedom and you compete much more with other cities, so you might do, not do crazy things because otherwise the rich taxpayers might leave your city. But it might also be bad that you have your, not so much tax revenue to do some social programs or social mobility programs. So that there's a balance to this stuck, and I don't know which way the pendulum will go. So overall, I would uh, you know have a lot of questions. I think it's a fascinating topic, and it will be extremely important topic. I should also mention that the, the projection is that you know, out of the 10 billion people who will be soon, 80% will live in cities. So we really have to understand that. Um, so that's you know what we will learn today to get uh, a hint what will be the future like. So let me now move to the poll questions that you answered. So will COVID-19 affect the cities differently than 9-11? And I have to say, this was never happened before. Uh, the answer is 100% yes. And nobody said no out of the respondees. And there were quite a number of respondees. So that's quite striking. So what cities will be hurt most by the double shock of Zoom and COVID? Will it be mega cities, metropolitan areas, or mid-sized? Now the answer is 48%, 35%, and 17%. And the third question was, what share of the US labor force will be working remotely in three to five years? Is it below 10%, 10 to 20%, or above 20%? And the answers were 4%, 43%, and 53%. So that's essentially majority thinks it will be more than 20% working from home across the whole labor force, which I know a lot of factory workers and they can't work from home, but it's also quite striking. So we're looking forward uh, to Ed Glazer's uh, presentation, the survival of the city. He's joined work with David Cutler, who is a health economist. So it's a nice combination to cover the COVID crisis. And uh, the, Ed, the floor is yours or the digital floor is yours <laughs> remotely, of course. Good having you with us. Thanks Thank again you. for doing it. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, and thank you all of us for for joining me this this morning. Um, let me start with uh, the wrong. Uh, let me start with the um, with the long history of of pandemics in cities. So cities have long done absolutely amazing things, but there are also demons that come with density. And uh, assuredly, the most terrible of these is contagious disease, is pandemic. Um, this is something that cities have lived with for a long time. Uh, the first of our recorded pandemics uh, in cities occurred in 430 uh, BCE. Let me see if this, okay, this should work now. Uh, slideshow. When plague came, plague came to Athens. Now, if you think about Athens of the fifth century BCE, it was really doing all that you could possibly imagine that a city could be doing 
to create breakthroughs in the arts, in, in politics, in, in economics, right? This is a city where collective genius gave us amazing things in philosophy, in mathematics, in architecture, in drama. They created the study of history itself. And of course, it's a pioneering democracy led by this character, Pericles. Now, the very success of Athens engendered the rivalry of Sparta, military, largely agrarian, a landed power. Pericles wasn't going to roll over. And so the Peloponnesian War was on. Pericles' strategy was to summon the Athenians behind the walls of the city. And you can see some of those walls in this, in this rendering of, the, of, the, of how the city might have looked. Um, but to summon the Athenians and their Attic allies inside the walls, to trust in those walls to keep out the Spartan hoplites, the enemy warriors, and to send forth the Athenian fleet to ravish the shores of the Peloponnesian Peninsula. As military strategy, it was perfectly sound. The walls did indeed keep out the hoplites. But while walls can keep out warriors, they can't necessarily keep out a virus or a bacteria. And so that's exactly what happened. Some form of disease entered in through Athens's port of Piraeus, because of course, then as now, cities are the nodes on our global lattice of transport and travel. They are the ports of entry for goods, for people, for ideas, and for viruses. And it seems to have ravaged the city. Thucydides, one of the two Athenian fathers of philosophy, fathers of history was there. And he really recounts a, a city that's gone amok in which people live only for the day because they do not expect to live to see tomorrow. Perhaps one fourth of the city's population died over a two year period. Athens would continue to soldier on for another 25 years in its fight against, uh, fight against Sparta before eventually losing. But in a sense, the glory of the city was forever dimmed. It would go from being perhaps the New York City of the Mediterranean world to being, I don't know, maybe it's Boston, then maybe it's Cambridge Mass, right? A shadow of its former self. Uh, now, this you know, was the first of our, of our great urban plagues that we have well documented, but it was certainly not the last. It was destabilizing. And indeed, one of the answers about urban resilience is that plagues are particularly damaging to cities when they set off political catastrophes, when they strike societies that are already teetering, and so they push them over an edge. The Antonine Plague that comes in the second century is not destabilizing. It comes during the period of the four good emperors when you know, Edward Gibbon, the great 18th century historian wrote that this was about the best time a human being could have possibly lived in history. This was a time in which the Roman empire was incredibly stable, perhaps a little bit like New York during 9-11 when a pragmatic consensus had come to, come to dominate the city and it felt very robust with respect to that shock. And so the plague came, it was a demographic disaster, but the urban system of the Roman empire continued to soldier on Flash forward to the next century, the Cyprian plague. This struck a Rome that was already a little bit more destabilized, and so it had further effects. It was one of the things which weakened the Roman Empire and weakened its ability to protect the edges of the empire, setting off the stage for the barbarian invasions of, of the fourth century. But of course, the worst of the ancient plagues came in 541 AD, 541 CE. Now, the backstory for that is that the Ostrogothic conquerors of the West had been in control of Italy for three generations. But the Eastern Roman Empire soldiered on. It was strong, it was mighty. It was led by its great emperor, Justinian. You can see him, he's the one with the crown. Now, Justinian saw weakness in the Ostrogoths. Theodoric the Great had been replaced by his far more mediocre children and grandchildren. And so he saw an opportunity to reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world. And he sent forth his great warlord, Belisarius, and, and he's the other fellow, the one without the crown in this mosaic, to, to reconquer Italy and to reconquer the North African breadbasket that fed Italy. Belisarius was enjoying enormous military success. It really seemed possible in the 530s that indeed this would be an interlude. And once again, peace and prosperity would come to the Mediterranean world. Just at that moment, the Black Death, Yersinia pestis, the bubonic plague shows up in Constantinople. It is a completely destabilizing event, right? Belisarius goes from being you know, a conqueror, a, a bringer of peace to being yet another petty warlord squabbling for success in Italy. The Eastern Roman Empire ceases to become a possible transformer of, of Europe and becomes the much smaller, much more you know, a narrow Byzantine empire. And in a sense, Europe itself descends into darkness as for century after century, for another 200 years, the Black Death continues to stalk Europe. And in some sense, this is the worst case scenario. 
This is a case of minimal resilience because Europe started from a weak place. And so the plague struck it, struck it over. Now, for most of the past 700 years, our cities have been more resilient to disease. They've actually been more resilient typically to disease than they have been to economic shocks. During the 19th century, during this earlier era of globalization, uh, our cities continued to grow despite death rates that were much higher than anything we would tolerate today, partially because people were poor and partially because cities invested in ways that made themselves healthier. So in the early 19th century, the prime plague was yellow fever. This is a mosquito-borne illness that emerges out of Africa in the 18th century, crosses over to the Caribbean, and then makes its way north to the cities of the eastern seaboard. And you can see there the yellow fever outbreaks in New York in 1807 and 1822, when perhaps 3% of the population uh, died during those years. So that's a death rate that's about 10 times higher than that of, of uh, COVID-19. Then starting in 1817, Cholera emerges in the Ganges Delta. It gets carried over land by the British Army in India, it then gets carried over land by the Tsar's Army in Russia and in and Poland. It gets carried over sea to London, to Paris, and to New York, where it starts to slaughter. As you can see there in 1832, more than 5% of New Yorkers died during that time period, right? An extraordinary death rate. Again, that's about 20 fold what we experienced in, in 2020, right? Just extraordinary death rates. And yet people continue to come to New York because they were poor. And because you could die of hunger in a rural area, or you could die of hunger in, in Ireland. And so New York, despite the poverty, seemed better than that. And the same thing was true of London or Philadelphia. Now, the cities did manage to invest in ways that made themselves healthier. And in some sense, that reminds us of how much we should be willing to, make, willing to pay to make sure that this event, this great pandemic, is, is a one-time affair. They invested not because they got the science right, but actually because they got the science wrong. There were two great schools of thought on disease in the early 19th century, one of which emphasized contagion, the spread of disease from person to person. They were right scientifically, but their proposed remedy, quarantine, proved to be relatively ineffective, both because it was poorly enforced and because mosquitoes can travel at least a bit over, over sea. By contrast, the alternative theory, miasma, which postulated, which hypothesized that the disease came out of fetid airs from swampy lands, right? This, is, this theory is wrong medically, but in fact, the remedies that it proposed, draining the swamp, bringing in aqueducts, bringing in sewers, right? Making the city healthier in a sense, right? They were the right, and they were the right recipes. And so New York built its great Croton aqueduct over the 20s and 30s of the 19th century. They built sewers, they connected to the water system. And in some sense, this is the, the, a hinge of history for government, where if you think about for prior to 1800, for hundreds of years, pretty much the only thing governments did was to kill people, right? Sometimes they were killing foreigners, and so you like that, but often they were killing their own people. But during the course of the 19th century, government started to save lives. And that happened in cities like New York, like London, and it happened through investments in public hygiene. Of course, it's not just about infrastructure, it's also about incentives. And as you can see, the Croton Aqueduct is built in 1842, and for 25 years, cholera continues to rage. You can see there the 1849 cholera epidemic. My great, 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 great grandfather died in that one. Um, and the reason was the same problem that we see in water systems in Sub-Saharan Africa today, which is the last mile problem. That in fact, you build this water system and you expect poor people to pay for connections to the system and they're poor. And so they continue to use their shallow wells, their boreholes, their pit latrines, and they continue to, to get waterborne illnesses. It's not until you have the Board of Health, which itself comes through a, a citizen movement led by Dr. Stephen Smith, uh, that actually starts imposing the incentives that landlords need, essentially Pigouvian taxes for those of you who are, are economists. Uh, but they charge landlords who don't connect to the sewer system, who don't connect to the water pipes. And so this ends up creating the incentives that you need to solve that last mile problem. Death rates start coming down. It's not free. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as our federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But it was an investment that seems to have been very well worth it. For indeed, since the influenza epidemic of 1918, 1919, we've had a blessed century where we almost have forgotten the fact that urban density can enable the spread of disease. And then all of a su sudden, 2020 happened. And in the early days of the plague, right, in the early days of, of COVID-19, this was a very urban experience for the same reason it was an urban experience in Athens. 
in 430 BC, because New York City was the port of entry for tourists returning from Italy, carrying the disease with them. And in those early months, it spread disproportionately in the Northeast and in connected cities like New Orleans, Detroit, Atlanta. And you can really see this. This is just showing you the relationship in those early months where denser areas were more likely to have the disease. And in those days, density probably also encouraged the spread of the disease, especially in settlements where social distancing is impossible. This shows the relationship between the share of the population living in a favela across uh, Brazilian metropolitan areas and the share catching the disease as of June 2020. Favelas are informal settlements where it's pretty much impossible for you to separate yourself from another person. And so the second feature of cities, which are defined by their density, manages to, to encourage the spread of disease. In the same sense that in an urban area, it is easier to exchange an idea face-to-face, -face, it's easier to sell a newspaper, it's easier to do anything that requires human proximity, also means that it's easier to spread illness. Um, this shows the relationship between the population living in slums and the share having the disease again in the early months. The remarkable serological work of Anup Malani, who looked at the blood of Mumbai slum residents as of July 2020, finds that as of that month, more than one half of the residents of some slums in India already had been exposed to COVID-19, already had COVID antibodies. Remarkably, the death rates were fairly low during that time period in those slums because slum dwellers tended to be young and they tended to be thin. Now, by November, this was but, a but, disease. Yeah, can that, I just ask a quick question? Of course, Marcus. It could be that the numbers were not correct, no? because in India, there's a lot of misreporting. A lot of death, especially in slums, are not reported in the statistics. It is true, although you would have thought, given that 50% of the population, you would really see it in the overall yes. death rates more than you did. And the overall death rates just didn't go up that, that high. I would, but I agree with you, Marcus. I would put no weight on the number of deaths allegedly due to COVID. I think that's, that's completely uh, unmeasurable. But um, in those days, you didn't really see in the early days a huge spike in, in overall death rates as well in, in Mumbai. Thank you. The, um, Thank you. Uh, so by November 30, 2020, uh, the, the disease had spread everywhere. Because in fact, you know, an airborne pandemic, as we saw in 1918, 1919, it can get everywhere, right? It's not like a waterborne pandemic where is if you've got your own well, if you've got your own uh, septic system, you're not going to get the, the waterborne pandemic. An airborne pandemic, it depends on behavior. And somewhat remarkably, in cities like New York, that behavior meant that in fact, the densest parts of the city were the ones that were least likely to get the disease, at least in the early months. This shows the relationship between COVID cases per capita Again, this would be as of about May 2020 uh, in different parts of, of New York City. And as you can see, the areas of Manhattan or Brooklyn Heights, the areas that have the tallest buildings are the areas that have the lowest case rates. By contrast, it's the Bronx, okay? it's Staten Island, it's the outer areas of Queens where COVID was more prevalent. There's no real mystery here, although it does seem to suggest that people aren't spreading the disease through air conditioning units very much. Um, this is explained very well by behavior. This shows the, the change in trips as measured by cell phone records as produced by SafeGraph. And it is remarkable that this is the first pandemic in which we can actually see people's behavior. We can see people's mobility. And you can see that the biggest reduction in the number of trips is in these inner areas, right? Whereas the, the least reduction occurred in the outer areas. Now, this isn't because the people living in Manhattan were smarter, right? It's because they were luckier. It's because they weren't in essential industries. It's because they were in industries where you could telework. And this just shows the change in the trips relative to the share in essential industries and the share in trips relative to the share who are working in occupations that enabled them to telework as coded by the Dingle and Name in 2020, right? And you can see there's a strong correlation between both of these. Um, this just shows the change in trips as opposed to the change in cases. And our estimates, and I'm just putting you up these, these regression tables to show that we did run regressions with lots of controls and place fixed effects. I don't want you to particularly focus on them. Our punchline number is that a 10% reduction in trips during this area was associated with a 20% reduction in the number of cases. So behavior was really very strongly linked to these disease, to the disease during this time period. Now, the coming of plague to our urban world feels to me scarier than 9-11 did. And again, this is apropos your, your first question, Marcus, mm -hmm. in part because what it felt to me like this pragmatic consensus that had merged out of a very difficult time for cities in the 1970s, when deindustrialization had led cities to the brink of bankruptcy, and cities had responded by electing these very pragmatic mayors who put you know, quality of life and delivering sort of centrist middle of the road goals ahead of everything. This is really unraveled in part because it seems that urban success hasn't been doing a very good job of flowing to everyone. 
So cities have always been places of inequality. They become more unequal lately. But you know, it was Plato who wrote that every city of whatever size is in reality two cities, one a city of the rich, the other a city of the poor, and they're perpetually at war with one another. Cities should never apologize for their inequality. They attract rich and poor people. They attract rich people because they're pretty fun places to be rich, at least prior to COVID. They attract poor people because they have more social safety nets. They have a stronger social safety net because they have, up, they have opportunities for, for service sector jobs, because they have the ability to get around without a car for every adult. But urban inequality is only tolerable when cities continue to do their historic function of turning poor children into rich adults. And uh, we have increasing evidence that they're really failing to do that. Our successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable, and this in a sense reflects the triumph of insiders who erect walls that prevent outsiders from building new housing and finding their own place in the city. And finally, of course, the deep unhappiness over policing and mass incarceration, which in, in a sense is the incomplete triumph of urban safety. So the left-hand side here shows the relationship between per capita GDP and population density across America's metropolitan areas. There's nothing surprising about this. This is a well-known fact. This is something economists call agglomeration economies, uh, and it's been documented in little, literally hundreds of papers. And it's not just that cities boost your wages. They actually appear to boost wage growth for adults who come to those cities. So this was found in an original paper of mine published in the Journal of Labor Economics in 2001, and in a paper using much better data in a much more convincing fashion by De La Roca and Puga in the Review of Economic Studies in 2016. But Opportunity Atlas data prepared by Raj Chetty and his co-authors shows that in fact, places with more population density have less upward mobility. What this data does is it looks at, at a generation born between 1978 and 1983 using essentially complete IRS records, they then link these children with their adult earnings and with their parents' income. And so you're able to see where the children end up when they are adults in the income distribution at, if they come from parents who are in the, at the 25th income percentile, who are poorer than three-fourths of Americans in 1980. And what you can see here, and this is across metropolitan areas, is the denser the metropolitan area, the lower the level of upward mobility. People are less likely to, to move up. These are gonna show you effects within metropolitan area. So this shows you that dense areas have less upward mobility within those dense neighborhoods, have less upward mobility within metropolitan areas. And this shows you that the farther that you get away from the central city center, that's CBD or central business district, that's an urban economic sort of lingo thing, um, the higher your upward mobility is. And you're moving from the 38th income percentile up to over the 44th. So it's a really fairly steep gradient of upward mobility with distance from the city center. And at least one part of this answer appears to be urban schools. So this shows you the regression discontinuity just at the edge of the central city school districts. And this is average over big city school districts throughout America. And you can see there's a jump up of about 2% uh, percent in the adult income distribution right at the edge of this central city school district. And on your left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you see the jump down in your probability of being incarcerated as an adult. So this is being in jail or prison as an adult. So that's dropping from about... 2.8% to uh, closer to 2%. So that's really a fairly substantial drop down in your probability of being incarcerated, which really reminds us of just the failure of, of our school systems to deliver uh, upward mobility for poor urban kids. Now, along with this failure to promote uh, opportunity is, is the fact that our cities have become increasingly unaffordable. This is largely self-caused. This is a decision about regulation. And one way that you can see that supply forces as well as demand are shaping these high prices is with this graph. Along the horizontal axis, along the x-axis, is the amount of new construction between 2000 and 2013 relative to the 2000 housing stock. Along the y-axis, along the vertical axis, is the gulf between the marginal cost of buying a home, the marginal price of buying a home, and the marginal physical cost of construction, how much it costs to just build a unit. And this is physical cost just in terms of the bricks and mortar, not assembling the land, not the lengthy legal delays. It's just the cost of building. And so a number three means it costs three times as much in the San Francisco metropolitan area to buy a house than it does to cost to build a house. And what you can see from this graph is the places that build a lot aren't expensive, and the places that are expensive don't build a lot. There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. There is robust demand for both Las Vegas and for San Francisco. But in Las Vegas, they built an enormous amount, and so the city stayed affordable despite that, that demand, which is true of New York City in the 1920s, when it also faced robust demand, and they built 100,000 units a year during some years, and the city stayed affordable. By contrast, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, New York build much less, and so they become, you know, risk becoming boutique towns affordable only to the wealthy. This just shows- mostly, 
Yes, Just Mark. a quick question on this. Is it mostly because of geography that, you know, Las Vegas, I can expand very easily while in New York City, I can only go uh, vertically? So think geography, geography yeah. is non-trivial, but there's a, a lot of power of, of the regulations as well. Mm -hmm. So this is Albert Saez's paper, which I published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2011. And I think my view, at least, is that land use controls are more powerful than geography. Part of the thing for New York to remember, I'll just sort of, this is from an old paper of mine with Joe Jerko, is as long as you're building housing, you can always deliver more housing without using land by just adding an extra story, yeah. right? And so you can calculate the marginal cost of delivering more housing space just by asking, what's the cost of the 21th floor? What's the cost of the 22nd floor? And in that case as well, currently, housing costs in New York are, are three to four times higher than the cost of adding that extra floor. So that tells you that the regulations are, are having an impact here. So this is the relationship between, just the cross-sectional relationship between the Wharton Index of, of residential land use regulations and housing, housing price. And these regulations also play out, they also shape how cities experience you know, housing bubbles, how they experience asset convulsions. So um, this is San Francisco. This is our archetype of a highly constrained market. And look at the period 1996 to 2006. This is a period which is in some sense the mother of all housing bubbles in the US. The orange line shows prices, right? Huge price increases, huge price drops. The green line shows quantities. Essentially, there's no change whatsoever in the amount of building. Basically, they're not building anything in San Francisco during this time period. By contrast, this is um, Atlanta, an uncontrolled city, right? Prices don't change at all during the boom, quantities soar up and then crash. And so we really shape the way that we experience things. And we have much stronger asset market convulsions, asset price convulsions in these constrained cities than in the unconstrained cities. We've also seen this wealth transfer from insiders to outsiders. And I want you to look, let's say at 35 to 50, 44 year olds. So these are young people. Um, we're comparing 1983 and 2013. We're holding prices constant. We fixed it all in 2013 dollars. So look at what's happened to the housing wealth for 35 to 44 year olds, it's at the bottom here at the 50th or 75th or 90th income percentile and flash forward to uh, 30 years later. 50th income percentile, it's gone down from 55,000 to 6,000. So that's you know an 85% drop. 75th percentile, gone down from 118,000 to 58,000. That's a 50% drop, right? Um, even the 90th percentile has gone down slightly. But if you go forward to the 65 to 70 year olds, you see the other, uh, the other thing, especially at the higher income percentile. So 90th percentile from 280 to 440, 95th from 420 to 700, and 99th from 940 to 2 million, right? By restricting new construction of housing, we've ensured that those people who were lucky enough to own, lucky enough to buy when housing was still affordable in places like Los Angeles in the 1970s, they experienced unbelievable housing price appreciation. By contrast, younger people find it impossible to buy in. And this is sort of a larger story that we tell in the book, that one of the reasons for Americans' urban malaises is that we've allowed our cities to be captured by insiders who erected rules of a variety of different forms, which limit both building and new business formation, and also lock people in place. And so this just shows the persistence of not working rates uh, across public use microsample areas. So these are different geographies between 1980 and 2010. So many of you may know, for example, the famous paper by Blanchard and Katz on regional evolutions that was published in Brookings in 1993, I think, which showed that high unemployment rate states in 1975 had, were not high unemployment rate states in 1985, that people by migrating across space smoothed out these labor market differences. This isn't unemployment, this is the share of prime age men who are, who are not working, which includes out of the labor force. But over the past 30 years, there's been no convergence. This correlation coefficient is over 80% and the coefficient is greater than one which really tells you that we've locked people in place partially because they can't move to places like New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco because housing prices are so high. And after all, over 30% of prime age men who are not working are living with, the, with their parents. And of course, our third source of dissatisfaction is the massive increase in incarceration. Now, in a sense, the so, safety- so Andy, Before you yes, so I can ask some questions. Can you elaborate a little bit on the political economy? Of course, it's very difficult to undo that because you have huge capital losses for the elderly people and uh, there will be a backlash politically. How would you handle this if you were in charge to you know, is erode essentially people's net worth in housing? By making it? Politically, it's, it's enormously difficult, Marcus. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I think it is um, typically the easiest, the, the most salient thing for people is they're actually not focused on losing housing wealth. They're focused on the inconvenience of construction for them. And so the easiest political fruit in terms of allowing more building is typically in brownfield sites and cities, 
So it's areas that are formerly industrial where you don't have a lot of well-heeled neighbors where you can just upzone. So creating as of right zoning in brownfield areas is by far the easiest pass forward. And it's typically been the one that cities that have wanted to build have done. Allowing more building in highly developed, highly organized residential communities is just a nightmare politically. Um, so that's that's been that's at least been my experience. So this is the last thing, you know, so crime rates, you know, I mean, New York in the 70s and 80s, when I was a kid, New York was a profoundly unsafe place. It is no longer. But our victory over urban crime was paid at a terrible cost. We paid by locking up millions of young men and treated millions of others to you know, fairly brutal policing tactics. And so this has engendered this you know, terrible uh, blowback, which we experienced in the wake of the killing of, of George Floyd in those protests during the height of COVID. Now, these inequities have come up against the fact that COVID was also a highly unequal plague. It was a highly unequal plague because of what less skilled people do and the rise of the urban service economy. So if you go back in terms of the economic implications of plague, if you go back to the Black Death or any time you have a subsistence agricultural economy, as long as the plague doesn't lead to political collapse, as it did in 541 CE, plagues leave the, the, those who remain richer. So the Black Death strikes in 1350. It is a demographic, it is a human catastrophe. More than one third of Europe appears to die. But right, if one third of Europe dies, that means land per capita has gone up by 50% for those who remain. And so wages soared in the late 14th century. And in a sense, you know, uh, those higher wages then fueled the urban renaissance of the 15th century because of demand for urban luxury goods. Flash forward to the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, which we have a wonderful paper on by Francois Veld of the, of the Chicago Fed, who looks in really close detail of what's happening. And the basic answer is you do have a short, sharp recession, mostly associated with um, factories shutting down, mines shutting down because workers got sick. But as soon as it's done, the economy goes, comes back and roars again, right? And, and it's largely, at least one way of understanding this is demand for durable goods, demand for most manufactured goods does not decline during this pandemic, right? It did not decline during our pandemic, which was a great durable goods boom. Flash forward a century when outsourcing and automation has made those you know, factory jobs disappear. And so the ability to serve a latte with a smile has been an employment safe haven for less skilled workers, despite automation and outsourcing. Right? And yet those jobs can vanish in a heartbeat when that smile turns into a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. And that's exactly what happened in the early months of the pandemic. Together with a whole set, set of co-authors, we were running surveys. Uh, this was published in the, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This is from April 2020. Um, and, you know, 45% of small businesses in our uh, sample were shut down. 86% um, of people in personal services, 86% uh, of the businesses in personal services, 70% in arts and entertainment. Um, and so we survived through a massive infusion of federal dollars, trillions in the Paycheck Protection Program, but it was certainly was an economic dislocation of the first magnitude that particularly struck poor workers who were faced with the option of either staying at home or, um, or, or and losing a paycheck or going to work. Now, the big question going forward is, are we ever going to go back to the office? And, and Nick Bloom and I are on somewhat opposite sides of this, of this view. Um, but certainly in the, you know, in the short run, this comes from Castle data. These are sort of data from a very select sample of offices that use high-end security systems that Castle runs. So from this sample, you can see that at least sort of in the, in the most closed metropolitan areas, that's New York, Jose, and San Francisco, San Jose and San Francisco. And these are you know, high-end buildings in high-end cities. You know, 80% are still not back. That's very different from the U.S. as a whole. So you said that um, you, know, you thought that more than 20 percent, that the poll answers was more than 20 percent of, of people would not be, would be working remotely. The current number, by the way, for the U.S. is 12 percent, according to the BLS working from home. So according to um, the BLS, only 12 percent of America is working remotely, which just tells you how different these prime office markets are from the average uh, American. Um, now, this is not the first time that people have thought that information technology was going to make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete, right? Um, there's always been a dance between centrifugal and centripetal technologies. And in the 1970s, it really looked as if cities were doomed, that they were dinosaurs of history. And during that period in 1980, the futurist Alvin Toffler wrote The Third Wave, where he predicted that just as highways and container ships had doomed urban industry, like the garment sector in New York. And remember, the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And it had been clobbered, right? Half a million jobs lost in a decade, right? By the deindustrialization of our cities made possible by transportation technologies. And so he wondered why wouldn't another form of transportation technologies, the ability to transport ideas, why wouldn't this make urban offices obsolete? Right? 
totally reasonable hypothesis. It's what's on many people's minds right now, right? Won't, won't Zoom make face-to-face -face contact obsolete? Well, for 40 years, right, for essentially my entire life, Toffler was completely and totally wrong, right? And he was completely and totally wrong because he, he got one effect of remote learning, but he missed a second effect, which is that what all these technologies did what you know, globalization also did was that they radically increased the returns to being smart. They radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. So this is an image of Michael Bloomberg's City Hall, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor, right? Trading floors are, in a sense, an, an anomaly. Here we have some of the wealthiest workers on the planet who normally would be enjoying lots of privacy in a, in a closed office. But in trading floors, they're right around each other. And you, know, you remember early on in the pandemic, Jamie Dimon wanted his traders back on the floor. Now, why are they there? Why is that so valuable? Because there's no industry in which knowing a little bit more can make you richer faster than finance. And so the returns to proximity are just very, very high in that industry. And in a sense, the high returns to innovation are all, to information are also what brought cities back. Right? We literally have hundreds of studies showing us that there, there's been a rise in returns to scale, and cities have catered to that. Now, if we thought that technology was making face-to-face -face contact obsolete, we should wonder why the most famous example of a geographic cluster in the 21st century is Silicon Valley, is the most teched up cluster. Right? Why Google, prior to 2020, which of all the companies in the world should have been able to send its workers home, why it did the opposite. Right? It bought the Googleplex, it bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan, and it's doubling down on more. Right? Because Google's leaders thought that proximity was how you actually engendered creativity. And you know, a more complicated world is a world in which it is easier for ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students, right? And we have these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another, right? These are just some things which just show you the, the connection between density and earnings. So this is employees per square kilometer across New York City zip codes. This shows that you know, wages are going up many times as you get to the denser parts of New York. This shows you a, another way of looking at the persistent joblessness of America. So, this is um, over the past 50 years, the share of prime age males who are jobless has risen from 5% in 1967 to 15% over the most of the past 10 years. And that jobless rate is not spatially neutral. It's clustered in a particular region, particularly the Eastern heartland, a region that starts in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through Appalachia and ends in the Rust Belt cities. And in a sense, you know, I can always imagine what, what a less skilled person is going to do in New York City in 20 years. There's going to be some job in the great service economy for them, but I don't know what they're going to do in West Virginia. I don't know what they're going to do in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and so the success of cities has not been neutral, right? This rise in the value of information has meant that, that skills and density have been complements. And we've seen a success of highly skilled metropolitan areas. This just shows population growth by county and the share of the population with a college degree as of 2000, right? This connection between the initial skill level measured by either just the actual skill level in, in the start period or the share of the population that's college educated in 1940 or whether or not you have a land grant college prior to 1940 or whether or not you have a lot of congregationalists in your population in 18. 50, right? These are all predictors of urban success, whether or not its success is measured by population or success is measured by earnings. So this just shows the relationship between per capita GDP and skills. This is something economists typically call human capital externalities. Enrico Moretti has been the, the you know, prime mover on documenting this. And a typical fact is that holding your years of schooling constant as the share of the population with a college degree in your metropolitan area goes up by 10%, your earnings also go up by 10%. Now, what do we know about uh, remote work? During, during a time of COVID or beforehand. Now, the best paper on this, of course, is Nick Bloom's paper on uh, randomizing call center workers in China. This comes from a paper by my two students, Natalia, Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington, which look at remote workers in an, a, um, in an American online retailer. They both find essentially the same things, which is that static productivity is unchanged or even improved by going remote. Right? These call center workers become quicker, they have less distractions, and at the very least, there's no loss. By contrast, both of them have the same fact about promotions. Promotion rates go down by, about, by more than 50% when you go remote. Now, what does being promoted mean? You can see this promotion to upper level, and that's what I'm talking about. You can see basically everyone gets promoted to mid-level. What does promoted to upper level mean? It means you get assigned to handle the difficult calls. Well, how would you learn how to handle difficult calls if you were all by yourself? You weren't, didn't have people around to listen to. How would your boss know that you were good at handling difficult calls if you, you were remote? So all of these learning channels, which are so natural when they're face-to-face, -face, are turned off when you're not together. This view of 
face-to-face -face contact as being about sort of dynamic learning effects is also given credence by what happened to new hires during the, the pandemic. So you can see here, this is by Jose Ramon Morales Aria and Carlos Daboin. On the left-hand side is jobs that have to be done live. On the right-hand side is jobs that can be done remotely. Live jobs, during the early days of the pandemic, employment crashed, new postings on burning glass technology also passed. So new hires and uh, employment both crashed, but they both came, up, came back, more or less moving together. By contrast, remote jobs, employment was steady as a rock, new hires, new postings on burning glass dropped by 40%. Right? And this is exactly what we see for computer programmers, where Microsoft tells us that its existing computer programmers were perfectly good at programming uh, when they went from home. But overall, new postings for computer programmers on Burning Glass were down by over 40%. And there's also a beautiful new paper by uh, Sonia Jaffe and her co-authors looking at collaboration in Microsoft, showing that there's been a real decline in synchronous communication. So this is people actually talking to each other as opposed to people posting things, and a real decline in collaboration across distant, different groups. And of course, if you imagine a remote world, you're imagining a world that is even more terribly unequal than the world of the past. And so this shows the share of the population who were teleworking at the height of teleworking, which was May 2020. And in that, in that month, according to BLS data, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were working remotely. And so this is a world that all of us on this call, I presume, know, knew. By contrast, only 5% of Americans with less than a high school diploma were working remotely. 15% of people who are high school graduates were working remotely. And so if this is your future, it's a pretty terrible one uh, for at least equality in the US. Now, I agree strongly with Marcus's comment though, that even though I really don't believe that hungry tech firms are gonna just tell people to dial, dial it in. I agree with Nick that hybrid work will, will exist, but I think by and large, if you think of your sort of you know, firm of 15, 20 and 30 somethings who are really hungry and trying to do something exciting in the technology space. Do I believe they're really all going to go home to their suburban homes, whether or not they're in New Jersey and Westchester and just dial it in? I just can't imagine that. That's just not what entrepreneurship ever looks like. But do I think they might relocate from Silicon Valley to Vail because they like skiing or Austin, Texas, because they like paying lower taxes or Honolulu because they like surfing? You bet. That seems like a very real possibility. And so in some sense, cities are facing extra pressure extra competition, which has both upsides and downsides, right? At its best, it does exactly what Marcus suggests, which is it hypercharges competition and it gets cities to up their, up their game. At its worst, it blindsides cities that are, you know, just in a very different place. And it ends up bleeding toward the sort of death spiral of the 1970s. So as I look forward, right, as we think about the sort of post-pandemic city, right? So first of all, if this shock goes on for another five to 10 years, Right? If we think that face-to-face -face contact has continued to be associated with death for a very long time, even because of this pandemic or another one, then it's hard for me to be optimistic about cities. Right? That, that is a world that is pretty catastrophic. I don't believe that that world ha will happen. I hope that our governments do everything it, that it takes, and our book is full of things that we think that it, it takes to, to make sure that this is a, a one-time event. Um, but there still will be shocks, partially because of Zoom and partially because of the aftermath of this pandemic. So. I tend to think that it's commercial space that is more vulnerable than residential space. So it is certainly true during the pandemic that Princeton prices have gone up by more than Manhattan prices, but Manhattan prices have also shockingly gone up. And at least when I see around me, right, young people in Cambridge, right, the hunger to be around other young people, to connect with other, other uh, human beings and to be living life live, that hasn't disappeared. And so my own bet is the commercial space will prove to be fairly, uh, will be in, under more threat than residential space. And there'll be pressure to reconvert from, uh, commercial to residential. Cities are likely to reallocate from the old to the young, both because the young are more hungry to meet new people and because the young are more hungry to learn from people in work. And remote work will continue. Global talent has just gotten more mobile and yet there's a dire need to deal with those urban downsides, to deal with the lack of upward mobility, to deal with high housing costs. And so I think this requires cities and states to up their game. Right? This means we need to have smarter government. We need to sort of move past tired arguments about more or less government. We need to have fewer regulations that bind small businesses or bind builders. And in, especially when dealing with upward mobility, we need to experiment and evaluate. Um, I see something very different in terms of the, the world of the high-end cities and the low-end cities going forward. So if you're looking at a city like New York or San Francisco, a 20% reduction in demand for commercial real estate will not show up in large vacancies once we're past this, right? Prices fall, but you know, price clears the market. And so the, uh, the vacancies don't, don't appear in the long run. Of course, we need to get back past the, the health risk. However, if you're looking at cities like Cincinnati or Detroit or Cleveland, 
a 20% reduction in those houses, they can in those in those offices that can lead to large scale vacancies. There will be landlords who will just walk walk away from their office uh, buildings at those prices. And so in those cases, the urban emptiness can just spill over and can reduce demand for other uh, other spaces. And so I fear that this will be an unequal pandemic, an unequal post-pandemic urban society. So let me end there. And we, there have a bunch of questions that I should probably be responding to. But I want my ultimate message to be optimistic, that cities have been doing miraculous things, have been enabling people to learn from one another and to do these incredible leaps of imagination since Plato and Socrates bickered on an Athenian street corner. And I believe very strongly that the age of urban miracles is not over. So thank you again for having me on, Marcus. Thanks a lot, Ed. So I think there are tons of questions. I have some questions too. Uh, let me first ask you, you, you said, you know, the plague essentially decimated the population size and the remaining, then there was a shortage of labor and wage rates went up. But is it still true in a world where we really want, it's a knowledge economy and the more people we have, the better it is. Now, in the olden days, it was more physical work. Now completely. it might be the other way around. There are fewer people and there are fewer ideas. And uh, Com completely, Marcus, I, I believe that strongly. So that that is a state that was a statement about 1350, not a statement about a statement about today. Although there may be some subsistence agricultural economies in, in Africa where you would see some of that effect, but certainly not the U.S. It's the other way around. I agree with that. Okay, great. So then I wanted to ask you, you know, your your analysis is very focused on the U.S. Would you say it's similar in Asia, including China and in Europe? Or would you say, what are, are there some slight differences there? Or I would say that, you know, there are quite dramatic differences. How could you speculate a little bit on, on that? Uh, absolutely. So, so the East Asian uh, countries have actually, particularly sort of Korea, Singapore, uh, Japan have distinguished themselves during the pandemic. I mean, the fact, the fact that they have more competent governments has really shown through. And I think any sense of fear about cities just is, would feel totally out of place in, in most, of those, uh, most of those economies. So you wouldn't worry very much about those. Um, European cities have had a more mixed record. So European countries have some have functioned better, some have functioned worse. Um, they often had fewer deaths because at least the Northern European countries were healthier going in. And so they had stronger health systems, and so they had had less of those comorbidity, comorbidities. Um, but I, I think many of the same issues are at play. Europeans tend to be less mobile, so the, the tendency that to just leave and go to Texas is going to be less pronounced in mm -hmm. in European cities, right? Where uh, so I would expect a little bit of less of this. Also, the sort of fear that progressive local governments will decide to penalize their, their wealthier taxpayers and wealthier businesses and create this 1970s death spiral. I don't fear that as much in Europe, just because local leaders have much less power. Um, in the US, you particularly want to watch at local leaders that, that sort of decide that it's OK to have very high crime rates, because that's going to be our response to defund the police. And so we've really got to figure out ways to make sure that we actually keep our citizens safe at the same time we make sure that our police treat everyone with respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. Great. So then, you know, there's one question which Jeff Rose would like to know, when is your new edition of the Triumph of the City coming out? Because he's using it for teaching and so many people use it for their urban teaching, urban economics <laughs> teaching. You know, I saw this book as being the second in that in that vein. So it's, it's a very different book. It's a book that's much yes. more of the moment. But I, I rarely have, I mean, I, I believe that there, this will be a trilogy. So this is dealing with New York, with the US in 2021. And I plan on writing a book that is more focused on developing cities, developing world cities, which actually all had been my focus for much of the last five years before the COVID pandemic struck, where I think in some sense, the most exciting things that are happening in cities are happening in the developing world. And then there's some questions by Carlos Capi. He would like to know, he emphasizes very much there's inefficient infrastructure spending in suburbia because it's top down and over-engineered. Uh, and also less resilient than uh, what he claims. Would you agree with that? That there's more inefficiency in suburbia in terms of infrastructure spending than in downtown? It's hard to know. Look, I, I will strongly agree with him that we have artificially subsidized our suburbs, both by the home mortgage interest deduction, which is a subsidy for owning rather than renting. And there's a very co strong correlation between structure type and ownership type in the US. So more than 85% of multifamily dwellings have historically been rented. More than 85% of single family detached housings have typically been owned, probably because of the incentives involved in maintenance in the two, in the two areas. But that means that if you're going to subsidize homeowning, you're going to subsidize people to leave their urban apartments and move into suburban homes. Similarly, we have particularly over the past 20 years, we've subsidized driving 
So by paying for more than half of our highway trust fund out of general tax revenues, we're basically encouraging people to drive longer distances mm. with, these, with these tax revenues. So um, infrastructure per se is a little bit harder for me to tell. So the extent to which infrastructure is about the highways, yes, I believe that that's being subsidized. But it's also true that our urban infrastructure is incredibly expensive to build. And partially, this is the infrastructure equivalent of NIMBYs in, the home, in, the, in home building. So in the 1950s, we were more like other countries and we did some bad things. We built highways through poor areas and we ignored the wishes of the local neighborhoods and that was terrible, but it meant that building wasn't that expensive. We moved to an area in which just as every homeowner can say no to every new housing project, every new homeowner can say no to a, a, any form of, of subway construction. And so our costs are three to four times of, of competing countries in terms of urban infrastructure in the US. So we're very bad at building it as well. So I, I like the thrust of his question, but I think there are just a lot of things that are going on at the same time that you need to unpack. And can you elaborate a little bit? I want to push you a little bit into climate change policies. Is there anything to argue we should live more in cities because it's a more efficient, less climate polluting way of uh, living? Oh, um, you bet. Let me see if I can find my, uh, my uh, well, I'll, I'll just do it verbally for a second. So, um, you know, I, I like to make this point all the time. This, it's, it's a point that's made in, in my paper, The Greenness of Cities and in, and in Triumph of the City. Uh, I, I didn't focus on climate change in this book because, you know, one, one source of apocalypse was enough for, for, for one book. I didn't, I didn't want to have all the horsemen at once. Um, but the, as you say, you know, we are a destructive species. And if you love nature, it's good to stay away from it. Uh, and, you know, we, we try in our, our paper, we hold income and family size constant, and we just find that carbon emissions are a lot lower in the U.S. if you live in a dense urban area than if you live outside. And that's both because of driving much shorter distances or taking public transportation and living in much smaller homes. So I agree with this point strongly. And one way of seeing this is if the great growing economies of India and China see their per capita carbon emissions rise to that seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen in wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. So we all have a lot to gain if at least the, the cities of the developing world build up rather than building out. And so I think that is, that is a reason. And you know, it makes it particularly crazy that we're actually subsidizing our highways rather than taxing them for the carbon emissions that they create. Great. Then I wanted to come to your ideas, you know, being together and would like to come to the future of universities. And you know, how do you see our teaching in 10 years and our research being done in 10 years? Of course, now we have the Zoom interactions and all this, not the same as a real physical conference. But if you project yourself at 10 years in the future, how do you think we will teach? Um, I don't think it's, you know, so I don't know what your experience has been. Um, I, th I thought that Zoom teaching was pretty awful. I, I thought that my ability to, so, you know, we can deal with old friends and we can deal with research relationships over Zoom perfectly well. We actually could have done it with a phone too, most, most of the time. So, you know, in fact, David Cutler and I wrote this book together. We've been friends for 30 years. We didn't even Zoom, we just used calls. We, and it was, it, was perfectly, it was perfectly productive. But while, you know, it's easy to, to manage a 30-year a relationship over Zoom, I have no idea how to get 19-year-olds excited about mathematical economics over Zoom. Right, that's just a very hard thing to do. And so I cannot tell you how grateful I am and how grateful I think our students are I mean, everyone that I talked to for being live again, right? And how dismal they found the Zoom experience. And certainly the studies that we've seen of remote schooling have just shown that it's somewhere between absolutely awful and counterproductive. So, I mean, I, I, I just don't think the face-to-face -face experience is gonna disappear anytime, uh, anytime soon. Do you think it's more because, um, you know, the teacher and the student interaction is so important, it's much better if, if it's uh, in person? Or is it because among the students, the discussion, you know, off the classroom that, you know, oh, I didn't understand that. Can you explain this to me? Or you can just pick up from your fellow students a lot. What so, do you think so, what dimension is more important on this? So Marcus, I think it's both. I have always believed that our students learn from more from their fellow students than from us. And so I think that's, that's sort of central. I often think our job is to get them excited about our topics and then let them figure it out themselves. And I think just the issue of inspiring them is, um, much harder to do uh, if you're unless you're you're live. Now, I do think there's a role for like you know if you have highly motivated students who are not able to come to the U.S. Sure, there's a role for Zoom. I mean, it's not like Zoom will disappear, but it's a it's a distinctly inferior process, especially for students who have any problem with motivation. It's a distinctly inferior process, I think, to having it being face to face. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so let me just pick up some more questions which came in just now. Uh, so. How can we make sure that one mega city, uh, that the mega cities are safer under attacks of COVID than uh, comparing to other natural disasters? Or let me stretch it a little bit. Uh, 
Do you, do you fear we will have future uh, pandemics coming up or is what are the biggest shocks we might experience uh, coming in the next? I know it's, it's a challenging question, but for cities in particular, is it really pandemics or could it be some other, you know, well, I'm thinking about deep fakes and things like that. We can't verify things anymore. So that might be a big challenge uh, as well, but I, I don't think it might probably uh, just make the difference between cities and non-cities. So I don't think I have any particular expertise in, in predicting future pandemics. Uh, I think it certainly is a risk. We certainly had plenty of warning signs before COVID that pandemic was a real possibility. We had SARS, we had MERS, we had H1N1, um, we had Ebola. Um, so I think the, the view that we're not going to have a new pandemic it seems like a, a seems Pollyannish to me. Um, but you know, before COVID, and I think now we're still appropriately worried about risks that climate change can pose for cities. More likely from high frequency events relative to the sort of slow rising of, of uh, sea levels. But both are worrisome, and I particularly worry about cities in the developing world that are very bad at protecting themselves. And you really see this, you know, differential impact of natural disaster on highly well governed areas versus poorly governed areas in terms of the impact of things like earthquakes. And there's a great paper by Matt Kahn in, in the Review of Economics and St Statistics from 2006 on this. And you know, the, the fact that I always like to keep in my mind is you know, two earthquakes strike in the same year, I think it's 2011, Haiti and Chile. Haiti is not a particularly well-governed place. Chile is a particularly well-governed place. Very few people die in Chile. You know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people die in, die in Haiti. And it just reminds you that the strength of civil society determines the impact of the, of the, of the onslaught. And so I really worry about, you know, natural disasters, climate change in the developing world, where you have places that are poor and too often poorly governed. And how much weight do you put on uh, the, the authorities and the trust in the authorities versus some social norms that, you know, that just help each other out? Or do you think both is equally important? Uh, I think it depends on the nature of the disease. So, or the nature of the nature of the shock. So when dealing with a with an earthquake, it's got to be the authorities. And I don't know that it's it's trust in the authorities having authorities that are trustworthy, right? <laughs> it's it's really you don't want to have a false trust <laughs> in the authorities. But you know, when it comes to, to actually dealing with these massive natural disasters, you really do need a capable public sector. I mean, there's a line that I'm fond of, you know, as a as a Chicago econ PhD, uh, who tends towards the liberty loving side, there are no libertarians in cities, or there should be no libertarians in cities. Cities really do have these, you know, needs for coordinated effort. And so you really do need um you do need, really need government. Pandemic, there's a little bit more that you, that just civil society can do without government. So there's a little bit more in sort of protecting those who get lost that you can do, uh, things like food banks or other things like that, that that small society can do. But this still with pandemic, you know, whether or not you're thinking about large scale quarantine or vaccine efforts or preemptive research, that's gotta be a, a government and not even a local government, that's even gotta be a national government or multi-government responsibility. Okay. There's another question which came in is, do you have any good examples of cities which use smarter government characteristics? You would say to serve as a role model for other cities. Is there anything, any city which stands out? Um, uh, so the, the city level rarely made, more, made the difference. It's more the country level. Uh, so certainly, apart from the East Asian countries that I've talked about, I think Yacinda Ardern did a great job in New Zealand, at least early on. Okay. Um, and part of the thing that's really special about her is she, embraced testing the asymptomatic, which is something that lots of economists, you may have, you may have written an op-ed on this, but lots of economists were very big on, you know, if we don't measure this thing, we're not going to be able to know when we can reopen. And oddly, most of the Western world completely ignored that. I mean, our, you know, National Institutes of Health didn't back this up. They were, were big on testing the, the those with symptoms, but they weren't big on just measuring the prevalence of the disease. And so you had lockdowns in the U.S. early on, but then you had people undo the lockdowns in places like Florida and Texas without any evidence that the disease was, was gone, whereas Yacinda Ardern only reopened New Zealand when she was pretty darn sure that the disease was gone. We really have to have the humility to learn and recognize that we don't know all the answers going in. And that's true in pandemic, and it's true in doing things like trying to promote upward mobility for urban kids. And a quick question about the trust in vaccines or the vaccine pickup is very different between cities and countryside. Do you think it's it's just a different level of education which is the main driver or is it because externalities in cities are much bigger and hence you, you want to somehow you're more exposed to it. What, what's your favorite? Uh, yeah. and, and then it was somehow different for polio. There was a much broader, the country came together and everybody was using polio. It was not this country a city divide which we're experiencing now, which in general we have this huge divide, I mean, the country and the, the city. Yes, it's tragic. And it's, I mean, I've always associated this with the politicization of this plague, uh, which is bizarre. I mean, there should not be a Republican or Democratic way to fight, uh, to fight pandemic. Um, and it, it's a very strange thing that we allowed this pandemic to become politicized. And, and as you say, the cleavages show up in expected fashion. Um, education is helpful. 
uh, you know, in terms of in terms of this, so education is a predictor of of you know vaccine uh, prevalence, but politics really is too. And so we really have to hope going forward that we embrace a more pragmatic, centrist view of of how to deal with these problems. So thanks a lot, uh, and perhaps we always stop at a positive note. If you could design the optimal city and have one little thing you implement, what would it be? So for me, cities are all about freedom. Cities are all about choices. Cities are archipelagos of neighborhoods that give you different options. And so it, the last thing I would want is sort of a centrally architecturally designed thing that says, this is the perfect way to live. What I love is cities that are built over centuries where there are lots of different things and where there isn't a regulatory straitjacket that freezes the city in place. But I really hope that as we go forward, the cities of America and the cities of the world can continue to be places that find room for outsiders, that find room for new brilliance and to shine in ways that enrich all of humanity. Thanks a lot. It's hard to beat and uh, conclude at a higher note. Thanks again, and I uh, hope to see you soon in the real world and uh, keep up your good research. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Thanks. Great to see you. Thank you for including Bye. me. Bye-bye.